A Case of Blackmail in Belgravia A Freddy Pilkington Soames Adventure Volume 1 Written by Clara Benson Narrated by Gethin Edwards Chapter 1 It was a splendid dinner at Babcock's. The restaurant was crowded and noisy, and the atmosphere festive. The manager had given them the best table, knowing that to do so was to ensure that the name of the establishment would, sooner or later, be cited in the society pages as having been the setting for yet another gathering of some of London's most fashionable and influential personages, since it was an open secret that at least one member of the party wrote a gossip column for one of the popular papers. Forty years after its founding, Babcock's, with its gilded ceilings, grandly arched alcoves and marble columns imported especially from Italy, was by now a venerable stalwart of Piccadilly and relied heavily on its reputation as the old dependable among the higher classes. Other restaurants came and went, their stars burning brightly but briefly, but still Babcock's went on, a superior and safe pair of hands with every intention of continuing for another forty years or more. Respectable as it was, it had not the slightest objection to being mentioned in the occasional breathless report as the place in which such and such a person had found his wife dining in guilty company with a husband of another and a scene had been narrowly avoided or in which two senior members of the opposition had hatched a plot to overthrow their leader, or in which one society beauty had snubbed another cruelly and publicly. That was merely good business, and Babcock's was perfectly happy to be known as a place where one might dine superbly and perhaps catch a whiff of scandal at the same time, although... Naturally, it affected to be entirely unaware of the less salubrious facets of its existence as enumerated with feigned disapproval in some of the lower publications. This evening the crowd was a mixed one. It was a Thursday night, one of the busiest nights for Babcocks, since, on Friday, many of the usual clientele would be going down to the country for the weekend. So many of the regulars were there, along with a number of foreigners, politicians, theatre-goers, businessmen, and even one or two film people. They had mostly been placed at tables towards the side of the room, where they might discuss confidential business or conduct illicit liaison with a degree of privacy, if so inclined. Not so the party in question, however, who were for the most part a raucous group and wholly accustomed to being looked at, indeed would have been most offended to be ignored, the ladies in particular. They had been placed at a table in the very centre of the room, happy to act as unpaid entertainment for everybody else, secure in the knowledge that they were quite the most interesting and important people there. Many of the out-of-towners were already darting furtive glances at them, wondering who they might be. The first to catch the attention, as always, was the golden-headed Mrs. Blanche Van Leeuwen, dressed all in white, an affectation of hers as befitted her name. Now forty-two, and on her second marriage, her days as a toast long behind her, she was nevertheless still a beauty, able to turn heads wherever she went although these days casual observers were less likely to remember who she was or recall the triumph of her first season in England following her arrival from Australia. More immediately recognisable was the man to her left, Captain Morris Atherton, the celebrated explorer. After his last expedition, in which he had nearly lost his life in the jungles of South America, he had announced that he was retiring to write his memoirs, although many said the spirit of adventure had not left him, and that he would not suffer to live a quiet life in England for long. From Captain Atherton the gaze passed to the fashionably thin Nancy Beasley, and then immediately darted about in search of her husband, who was sitting across the table from her. 
The marriage of Dennis and Nancy Beasley was followed with great interest by the general public, since it was considered something of a miracle that they were still married at all, given Dennis Beasley's penchant for the company of young ladies of the chorus and Nancy's loud and public rage whenever she caught him at it. Theirs had been a volatile relationship from the start, and most of it, seemingly, had been conducted under the public eye, much to the disgust of Nancy's father, the late munitions millionaire. After ten stormy years of marriage never blessed by children, those in the know said it was only a matter of time before their names appeared in the divorce courts. On Nancy's left was Lady Bendish, widow of Sir Henry Bendish, the inventor and philanthropist. Willowy, drooping, and with a mournful, almost tragic air about her, she was listening politely to Dennis, who seemed to be telling her an amusing anecdote. To the left of Dennis was a small, bird-like woman with bright eyes that darted about constantly. Cynthia Pilkington Soames was perhaps the least recognisable of the party, but also the most dangerous, since she it was whose column appeared each week in the Clarion, so it was always best not to get on her wrong side, lest one find oneself unflatteringly portrayed in that week's paper, or worse, not mentioned at all. Under the nom de plume of Robin, she wrote of gay evening parties, described the latest outrageous frocks sported by well-known beauties, dropped hints of scandals and affair, and with one stroke of her pen could make or ruin a reputation for a whole season. Every Friday, friends and foes alike scoured the page eagerly to see whether Cynthia had anything to say about them and felt alternately relieved or slighted, depending on the result. That evening, indeed, there had been some little tension between Cynthia and Mrs. Van Leeuwen, who was smarting at the unfounded suggestion in last week's column that she had been lying about her age and was in fact nearer fifty than forty. Barbed remarks, sugar-coated with tinkling laughter, had passed back and forth between the two ladies all evening, and it had taken all the diplomatic finesse of the man who sat between them to prevent mutual tensions from descending into open warfare. It was odd that, though the table was a round one, nobody could have doubted that this last gentleman mentioned sat at the head of it and was the most important member of the party. Nicholas Maltravers, or Tiki, as he was known to his many close friends, was a man whom any reader of the society pages would recognise immediately, since not a ball or a party or a picnic or a wedding was held without his being invited. When society matrons drew up their guest lists, they would invariably add, Oh, and Tiki, of course. If there was an empty chair to be filled at a private dinner, Tiki was the man who would be called upon to fill it. Every page of his diary had something in it, so much so that he might have chosen never to dine at home if he liked. He was invited to everything and could afford to pick and choose. He was a bon vivant, perched at the very pinnacle of society, although nobody could quite say how he had achieved this position, since he did not seem to be celebrated for anything in particular. He was certainly not known for his looks, being past fifty, and of unhealthily sleek and glistening appearance, with hooded eyes and a curved smile that might almost have been described as a knowing smirk. His general habits and dealings with others did not bespeak any particular virtue of character. His wit could best be described as laboured. Nor did he throw parties of his own, but contented himself with attending those of his acquaintances, at which he was sure to be surrounded by a crowd of well-wishers, who shrieked delightedly at his pithy observations, and seemed to want nothing more than to be admitted to his inner circle of friends. How he had attained his exalted status was a mystery, therefore, and it could only be supposed that he had managed it by a sort of osmosis, or perhaps even a magical charm. Whatever the case, and whether fair means or foul had been employed, he certainly seemed to relish the attention, and even accept it as his due. That evening was no different. 
He was fated and loved by his guests. His every comment agreed with, his every witticism seized upon and laughed uproariously at. If the party was the centre of attention at Babcock's, he was the centre of attention of the party. He dined lavishly, because it was his birthday, and because, although the restaurant was an expensive one, nobody would have dreamt of letting him pay. The other gentlemen ate heartily, while the women ate little, or affected to. The caviar and oysters were declared to be the freshest anyone had ever tasted, and were washed down with a most invigorating shabby. while the turtle soup was neither too hot nor too cold, and went beautifully with the sherry. The salmon and new potatoes were cooked to perfection, and were accompanied by a bottle of Montrachet from one of the oldest vineyards in France. After the roast venison, which all agreed was as tender as spring lamb, and which was served with an intriguing red claret, there followed ices and petit four, complemented by a fine muscat. Nobody had room for savoury, and so the order for coffee was issued, and the ladies glanced significantly at one another, and then at Tiki. Tiki, darling, said Nancy Beasley, bringing out something from under the table. It's time for your present. Tiki assumed a look of combined surprise and modesty as the little gift-wrapped box was presented amid rowdy applause and squeals of excitement. I believe you are spoiling me, he said. He smiled around at them all, and then carefully unwrapped the gift and brought out a little silver flask of the sort that fits in a pocket. Look, it's engraved, said Cynthia. So it is, said Tiki. How perfectly delightful. May I see, said Blanche van Leeuwen. She took the flask and exclaimed over it, then passed it to Captain Atherton, who also wanted to look at it. The little silver flask was passed from hand to hand around the table, since, although all had contributed, not all had seen it. Tiki took it again and regarded it with polite interest. But you must try it, Tiki, said Nancy. Don't let it be one of those presents that's never used. The knowing smile played around Tiki's mouth again, and he glanced up slyly at the other two men. I believe I shall, he said. He summoned the waiter. Do you have any of the 1820 cousinier? he said. The waiter replied in the affirmative. Then you'd better bring it, said Tiki. We'll have the whole bottle. The smiles on the faces of the other two men became wooden at the thought first of the cost and second of such a flagrant waste of good cognac. The bottle was brought and a large measure decanted into the flask. Tiki looked around. How splendid to have such true friends, he said, with every appearance of sincerity. A toast to you, my dears. He raised the flask and took a large mouthful, then another. Delicious, he said, as the other men eyed the remainder of the cognac still in the bottle. Here, take this and share it with the kitchen staff, said Tiki to the maitre d'hôtel who was hovering nearby. The man was fulsome in his thanks, and the expressions of Dennis Beasley and Captain Atherton became more wooden still as the bottle was carried off and placed carefully to one side. The dinner was paid for, and there was a great fussing and stirring as everybody stood up, while at the other tables conversations were paused briefly as all the other diners took the opportunity to stare at the party as they left. Then they all moved out into the chilly October night, walking unsteadily, for a great deal of wine had been consumed, and calling out extravagant praises to the maître d'hôtel as they went. And then they were gone, and everybody went back to what they'd been doing, while the waiters raised their eyebrows at one another. Outside there was some little bustle as the arrangements for returning home were decided. Mrs. Van Leeuwen summoned her motor-car, in which there was room to carry three other people at a pinch, and offered to take the Beasleys and Lady Bendish home, pointedly ignoring Cynthia Pilkington Soames. Captain Atherton lived nearby on Dover Street, and intended to walk home, since he was in need of some air, he said. He cut short their goodbyes and went off with a wave. 
There was much kissing and exclaiming among the women and much promising to telephone the next day. Then Mrs. Van Leeuwen's car departed in great state, and somehow Cynthia found herself in a taxi to Belgravia with Tiki Maltravers, who lived in Caroline Terrace. Well, that was a most delightful evening, said Cynthia. It's such a pity Herbert had to entertain that dull man from the bank at the last minute and couldn't come. Thank you, Tiki. It was my pleasure said Tiki graciously, as though he had paid for it. He was looking rather pink and uncomfortable. I fear I may have overeaten, however, he said. Oh, goodness, said Cynthia. Perhaps a little digestive when you get home will do the trick. I dare say it will, he replied. They sat in silence as the cab rounded Hyde Park Corner. Cynthia noticed that Tiki was breathing heavily and that he had begun to perspire freely. Dear me! You don't look well at all, she said. What about a nip of brandy now? You have that little flask we gave you. Perhaps you are right, he said. He brought out the flask from his pocket and fumbled with the cap, then took a mouthful of the cognac and coughed. The taxi drew up. In terrace, the driver announced. Cynthia alighted, as did Tiki, with difficulty. I think I shall walk the rest of the way, he said. I dare say the fresh air will do me good. The taxi departed, and Cynthia hurried up the steps to her smart front door and looked for her key. Tiki was standing on the pavement, swaying gently, and she glanced at him in concern. Are you sure you're all right, Tiki? she said. He opened his mouth to say something, and then took a step forward as though he wanted to come into the house with her. I began Cynthia, then uttered a little shriek of disgust as Tiki fell heavily against the railings and proceeded to be sick on the steps. Well, really, she exclaimed, retreating. I should have thought you might have held it in until you got home. But Tiki Maltravers was beyond listening to anything. He slid down the railings to a sitting position and remained there, fighting for breath and twitching slightly. It had at last occurred to Cynthia that something was very wrong. Tiki, she said. He lifted his head and fixed her with a hollow stare. Poisoned! he said in a hoarse whisper, and with that, expired. Cynthia stood for a second in astonishment, then looked about her as though she suspected someone of playing a tasteless joke on her. She moved gingerly forward, being careful not to tread in the remains of Tiki's last birthday dinner, and touched his cheek. There was no response. Carefully, she lifted an eyelid. One eye stared balefully back at her. There was no doubt at all that he was dead. Oh, dear me, said Cynthia. Chapter Two Elsewhere, Freddy Pilkington Soames had had a most pleasant evening, having passed it in indulging in youthful high spirits at a fashionable new nightclub near Regent Street. At two o'clock, he and his friends reluctantly obeyed the order to vacate the premises and emerged into the London night, preparing to head homewards and sleep the sleep of the just. Freddy was feeling quite delightfully fuzzy in the head, having that evening discovered a new type of cocktail containing champagne, Cointreau, bourbon whiskey, and a secret ingredient which he could not identify, but which was half sweet and half sour, and rounded the whole thing off deliciously. The more he drank of it, the better it tasted, and since Freddy was a keen and scientific seeker of pleasure, indeed could wax quite philosophical on the subject at times, he had judged it only right to experiment exhaustively in order to ascertain to his own satisfaction that no greater joy was to be had on that particular evening at least. The result was that by the time he left the nightclub, his brain and his finer motor abilities had mutually agreed to part company for a few hours. No matter, however, the world was a beautiful place, and Freddy felt not the misery of life's travails as he tottered gently towards Oxford Street in search of a taxi, a beatific smile on his face. 
Had any malefactor chosen at that moment to jump out in front of him with a dagger or a pistol and demand monies, it is very likely that Freddy would have pressed his last shilling upon the man, given him his hat for good measure, and sent him on his way with a cheery wave, so well disposed was he towards the world in general. After an abortive attempt to flag down a private motor-car, Freddy eventually managed to procure himself a taxi. He was just about to pronounce his destination to the driver when he was rudely shoved aside. "'Pond Street,' said a familiar voice. "'Come on, Freddy, get in. You're holding the man up.' It was his friend, Mungo Pruitt, who had leapt into the conveyance before him and who now reached out and pulled him in. The driver set off. Freddy's mind was not working as fast as it ought, and it took him a good few moments to realise that Pont Street was in the opposite direction from the one he wanted, for Freddy worked an honest living as a pressman of sorts, and had recently taken rooms near the offices of his newspaper, so as to be saved the inconvenience of having to spend more than five minutes in travelling to work of a morning. "'But I, I don't want to go to Pont Street,' he said moving his mouth carefully, since his faculty of speech was not at its best at present. Pont Street is in quite the wrong place. What are you talking about? said Mungo. It's where I live. But I want to go to Flea Street, said Freddy. Flea Street be damned, said Mungo. Why would anybody want to go to Fleet Street at this time of night? Or any time, in fact. It's full of oily little men with pencils and cameras whose only object in life is to catch one in the act of doing something unspeakable. This was a point with which Freddy could not truthfully disagree, and yet the fact remained that he did not wish to go to Pond Street. By the time he had succeeded in formulating in his head an unanswerable argument for getting his own way, however, the taxi had already arrived at Pond Street and Mungo had leapt out. Listen, said Freddy, who was now ready to present his case. He jumped out after Mungo, preparing to give a long and impassioned speech as to the desirability of having instructed the driver to go east first rather than west, but before he could begin, Mungo had paid the driver, and the taxi had pulled away without him. "'I dash it!' said Freddy, waving desperately at the departing vehicle. "'Mungo, you ass! What the devil did you do that for?' "'Do what?' said Mungo. "'We're home, aren't we?' "'You might be,' said Freddy, "'but I'm not!' I want to go to Fleet Street. Well, do you? I thought you were joking, said Mungo. Still, I'm sure there must be a taxi around here somewhere. And now it's off to bed for me. Don't stand there too long, old chap. It's cold out here. Cheerio. And with that, he was off, leaving Freddy standing in a deserted street a good three miles from home. Lesser men might have railed against a similar inconvenience. Not Freddy. The night was cold, and all he wanted at present was to find a comfortable bed, any bed might do, and collapse into it for eight hours or so. If Fleet Street were denied him, then let another sanctuary receive him. A short distance away was the house his mother used when she was in London, for which he had a key. She would most likely be tiresome about his current condition, but it was late, and perhaps he could creep in without being heard. He set off unsteadily down Chesham Street, and within a very few minutes was turning into Eton Terrace. The house was dark. Perhaps nobody was at home, which possibility suited Freddy very well, since he was more afraid of his mother's sharp tongue than he cared to admit. He felt in his pocket for key, and, after a few false tries, succeeded in inserting it into the lock. It turned, and the door gave way more suddenly than he had expected. It immediately hit an obstacle, something soft, yet unyielding, and at the same time he heard a shriek. He pushed at the door and felt someone push back from the other side. "'Go away!' a voice said frantically. Freddy recognised it as that of his mother. "'What are you doing?' said Freddy. "'Let me in.' "'Freddy!' exclaimed Cynthia. "'You frightened me half to death. Quick, come in!' The door opened a little way, and he was able to squeeze in. The entrance hall was almost dark, with only a little light coming in through the glass above the door. "'Why are you standing here in the dark?' said Freddy. Well, "'Who's this on the floor?' For he could feel with his foot that the obstacle blocking the front door was human. "'Shh! Not so loud!' hissed Cynthia. "'It's Dickie!' "'Dickie?' Freddy's brain was by no means operating at full capacity, but he felt it might matter less if he could see.' He groped along the wall and switched on the light. 
Cynthia gave a little squeak. Freddy regarded his mother, who was shrinking against the wall, wide-eyed, still in her evening dress and fur coat, and then turned his attention to the thing on the floor. Tiki was lying still and supine on the black and white tiles, eyes closed. His face was white. You're right, it is a Tiki, said Freddy. Why is he sleeping there? He'll be awfully stiff and cold when he wakes up. He's not asleep, he's dead, said Cynthia. And please, keep your voice down, darling. There's a policeman walking up and down outside. Had to run out and clean up the mess quickly while his back was turned. It was quite horrid. You know I hate that sort of thing. Dead? said Freddy. Are you sure? Perhaps he's just unconscious. He bent over unsteadily to peer at the motionless figure at his feet, then straightened up sharply. Oh, he's dead, he said in surprise. That's what I'm trying to tell you, said Cynthia. He died on the steps and I had to drag him inside. He was awfully heavy, and now I don't know what to do with him. Why call someone to take him away, surely? A doctor, perhaps? Or the police? Didn't you say there was a bobby just outside? No! exclaimed Cynthia. We can't call the police. But why on earth not? You can't leave him here. He's not exactly ornamental, and he's blocking the doorway. The police will tidy him away nicely, and soon it'll be as though he'd never been here, you'll see. Don't be silly, Freddy. It's not funny. We need to get rid of him somehow, but without the police. Freddy's head was starting to spin, and he had the feeling there was something about the situation that he had not quite grasped fully. Look here, it's late, he said. Perhaps we ought to leave him here and go sleep on it. Then we can call someone tomorrow with a clear head, and they'll come and fix everything for you, and you won't have to think about it any more. But his mother was shaking her head vehemently. No! she exclaimed. It's Mrs. Hanbury's day tomorrow, and you know what a dreadful old cat she is. If she turns up and finds a dead body here, she'll tell your grandfather, and he'll be terribly cross with me. You know how long it took me to persuade him to let us use the house again after we held our rainbow joy party last year? I never meant everyone to start throwing paint at each other, but you remember the mess, and the bill for redecoration was rather high. It won't take much to set him off again. We must get Tiki out of here tonight. But why don't you want the police? said Freddy. And how did he die, anyway? he added as an afterthought. Poison, said Cynthia. At least I think so. Poison, said Freddy. He stared as the reality of the situation began to seep in slowly. You don't mean to say you killed him? Don't be absurd, darling, said Cynthia, although she looked a little uncomfortable. Why on earth would I kill Tiki? But then how did you know? Because he told me so himself. He was ill in the taxi on the way back, and when he got here he collapsed and was sick, and then he exclaimed, poisoned, just like that, and died. Good God, said Freddy. Exactly, said Cynthia. It was awfully sudden. We were out, a group of us, you see, for his birthday, and he ate far too much. Between you and me it was rather revolting, and I could hardly bear to watch it. And there was lots of wine and champagne, and that dreadful Van Leeuwen woman was there. I don't know who invited her. And, of course, then I was left without a lift, so I ended up in a taxi with Tiki. He spent half the journey drinking brandy out of the flask we gave him because he didn't feel well, but it wasn't until he dropped dead outside the house that I found out just how ill he was. At any rate, it looks most suspicious that I was the last person to see him alive, so you see why we can't go to the police. I don't, actually, said Freddy, who was struggling to keep up. Why can't we go to the police? Why, because everybody will think I did it. I'll probably be arrested at the very least, or taken off for questioning, but I'm supposed to be going to Marjorie Belcher's reception tomorrow afternoon, and you know how straight-laced she is, and she's got Mr. Bickerstaff in her thrall, and he'll probably give me the sack, and to be perfectly frank, darling, I could do with the money at the moment. Oh, she exclaimed suddenly. What? said Freddy. Nothing, said Cynthia. I've just thought of something, that's all. Never mind, uh, there's nothing I can do about it now. I shall just have to think about it later. In the meantime, we have to get rid of Tiki. I suggest you go and leave him outside his front door. Then they'll think he died there, and nobody need ever know he was here. It's only two hundred yards or so. I'll keep a lookout, if you like. What do you mean you suggest I leave him outside his front door? said Freddy. What has all this to do with me? Well, naturally, I can't carry him, darling. What an extraordinary idea. You must do it. But, Freddy, I simply insist. You know perfectly well. She suddenly stopped and her eyes narrowed. Have you been to 
winking, she said, accusingly. No, lied Freddy. You have, haven't you? I can always tell. Oh, Freddy, just when I needed you, I, I feel you've let me down somehow. It was only... I, I couldn't help... Mungo insisted. Look, here, Mother, can't a man go for a perfectly innocent cocktail or two that... Oh, never mind that now, said Cynthia. We'll just have to do the best we can with what we've got. I only wish you had the sense to remain sober. Her tone was reproachful. Well, if you told me in advance you were planning to do away with someone, I might have, said Freddy. Where's father, by the way? Doesn't he usually dispose of your victims for you? Don't be impertinent, said Cynthia. As a matter of fact, your father was supposed to come this evening, but he had to take Mr. Foss out for dinner at the last minute, and he said he would go straight back down to Richmond afterwards. Now, it's getting late, and I'd rather like to go to bed, so let's get this over and done with instead of standing here talking. You pick him up, and I'll just peep round the front door to make sure the policeman isn't still there. There is no doubt that Freddy had engaged in some, not to say many, morally dubious activities in his time. Nonetheless, let the record show that he was not, as a rule, the sort of young man to aid and abet in the disposal of a dead body, at least not while sober and in his right mind. However, his defences were always low when he was in drink, and in such a condition he was easily taken advantage of. Moreover, Cynthia Pilkington Soames was not a woman to be easily resisted at the best of times, since she had a tendency to talk incessantly until she got her own way. At present, therefore, Freddy's mind was fastening very hard on the facts it would comfortably hold. The first being that there was a corpse cluttering up the entrance hall, and the second that he would not be allowed to go to bed until it had been tidied away. He sighed and resigned himself to the inevitable. Oh, very well, then, he said. But I should like to make it clear that I do this on sufferance. He bent over Tiki and prepared to do as his mother said. According to his imagination, it ought to have been an easy matter to hoist the body up and fling it over his shoulder, but, as he now discovered, picking up a corpse is not as easy as it sounds, since a dead weight is just that, and even fully sober it is unlikely that he would have been able to lift Tiki, who had not been a small man. After a certain amount of grappling that many would have considered not only unseemly, but also highly disrespectful to the dead, Freddy stood back, panting. It's no good, he said. I can't lift him. But then what shall we do? said Cynthia. Can you drag him instead? What, and wake the entire street with a noise? said Freddy. I might as well perch him on a barrel organ and play it as we go. At least the money might pay for my bail. Now you're being silly, said Cynthia. But talk of a barrel organ had given Freddy an idea. What about a wheelbarrow? he said. Where might we find such a thing? I couldn't tell you, said Cynthia. Not around here. My wagon, exclaimed Freddy. What? You haven't thrown his way, have you? My little wagon that I used to ride in. Do you remember? You had to pay the man when I ran over his dog. He was very annoyed. Oh, that! I dare say it's still upstairs somewhere, most likely in the attic. Why? But Freddy had already disappeared. He reappeared five minutes later, bearing a child's toy cart, and set it down on the floor. They regarded it dubiously. Will it hold his weight? said Cynthia. We shall just have to try it, said Freddy. You take his feet. Oh, goodness, said Cynthia, wrinkling her nose in distaste. With some effort, they managed to load Tiki into the wagon. His limbs were starting to stiffen, and he sat at an almost comical angle, his head tipped quizzically to one side as though he were wondering what was going on. Now, have a look outside. If there's no one out there, I'll make a run for it, said Freddy. Cynthia opened the door and looked up and down the street. The policeman has just turned into Eton Gate, she said in a whisper. Go out and watch him, said Freddy. Cynthia hurried quietly down the steps and went to the corner of the street. She watched for a moment, then gesticulated wildly to signal that the coast was clear. Freddy pulled the wagon with a difficulty over the threshold and bumped it down the steps, then stopped to rearrange Tiki, who had begun to slide out. He looked about him nervously, but saw nobody. Well, here goes, he muttered. The string on the little cart had long since frayed through, so there was nothing for it but to bend over and push. 
The wood creaked and buckled under Tiki's weight, but held, and the strange procession moved down the street, slowly at first, then faster. Cynthia was still standing at the corner, glancing about as Freddy stopped to catch his breath. Go, darling, she said, and Freddy did so. Now was the time to move as quickly as possible. Eaton Gate was deserted. Presumably the policeman had turned into another street. Freddy braced himself and pushed Tiki across the road. It was hard work, for the wagon refused to maintain a straight course and was doing its best to veer off in any direction that took its fancy. Moreover, every time it did so, Tiki slid a little further out and Freddy had to keep stopping to adjust him. He continued down Eaton Terrace and turned right into Caroline Terrace. Tiki lived not quite halfway along at number 25. Freddy straightened the wagon carefully and, with one last burst of effort, bent almost double, broke into a run. He picked up such a turn of speed that he almost shot past the house and had to stop suddenly. The wagon skidded and came to a standstill, unlike Tiki, who slid off and landed with a thud on the ground. Freddy winced and glanced around, for it seemed to him as though he must have drawn the attention of everyone in the street. Fortunately for him, there was still nobody about, but Tiki was lying on the pavement for anyone to trip over who happened to be passing later. With a sigh, Freddy hefted him up under the arms and dragged him laboriously up the front path where he propped him against the railings as best he could. Tiki was home at last. Cynthia was on the landing in her dressing gown when Freddy arrived back at the house and seemed surprised to see him. Oh, it's you, darling, she said over the banister. Did you have a good evening? Freddy opened his mouth to reply but could think of none suitable. I suppose it's too late to get back to your rooms now, she went on. You may have the blue room, but try and keep it tidy. Don't forget that Mrs. Hanbury is coming to do tomorrow, and she gets very upset if there's any mess. Good night. And with that, she went into her room and shut the door, leaving Freddy standing in the hall, tired, disheveled, and with an incipient headache. At length, he went upstairs and into the nearest bedroom, where he collapsed onto the bed fully dressed and was asleep, within minutes. Chapter 3 The sound of singing filtered through into Freddy's brain, waking him by degrees. It was a low, droning, tuneless voice, which once heard was impossible to ignore. Freddy pulled a pillow over his head, but it was no good. The singing was just outside the door, and whoever it was seemed set fair to continue for the rest of the day, for the hymn, if that was what it was, appeared to have an infinite number of verses. Not a cheerful hymn about bountiful harvests and joyfulness, either. It was one of those paeans composed with the especial purpose of reminding one of one's inevitable doom. Something about being dragged to the judgment seat and dwelling in torment. As it happened, that was exactly how Freddy felt at that moment, for it seemed as though an entire orchestra had crept into his skull while he was asleep and begun to perform. Except that each musician had decided to play a different tune at once. The percussion section was particularly enthusiastic, and he was almost sure that one of the percussionists had mistaken him for a bass drum and was pounding him over the head rhythmically with a large mallet. There was no sleeping through such a racket, and so at last Freddy gave it up and groped for his watch. It must have stopped, he saw, for the hands pointed to half-past ten. Then he remembered that it had been working perfectly well last night at eleven o'clock, and was seized with a terrible foreboding. He put the watch to his ear. It was still ticking. Freddy's editor, Mr. Bickerstaff, had been expecting him at the Clarion's offices at nine, having summoned him for an official dressing down about his punctuality, and this was hardly a good beginning. He groaned. Just then there was a knock at the door. "'Beg pardon, Mr. Freddy,' said a voice. It was Mrs. Hanbury, the indefatigable singer of hymns, who let nothing stand in her way when there was dusting to be done. Least of all, young men who were still in bed long after they ought to be up. Freddy sat up. It's all right, Mrs. H., he managed, although the sudden movement had caused the brass section to begin improvising a polka. 
I'm going out now. You can have the room in five minutes. No hurry, sir, intoned Mrs. Hanbury, and began singing again. Ten minutes later, Freddy was out of the house and heading for Sloane Square as fast as his legs would carry him, which was not very fast, since for some reason he was aching all over and felt as though he had been in a fight. His memories of the night before were hazy, not to say almost non-existent, but this was too common an occurrence to worry him, and he expected it would all come back to him sooner or later. There was something about a dispute with Mungo over a taxi, he remembered. He supposed Mungo must have won, since here he was in Belgravia rather than Fleet Street. Damn the fellow! But for him, Freddy would not be in his present predicament, and would not be having to run halfway across London still wearing his evening things. Indeed, his appearance was causing some amusement among passers-by. After another glance at his watch, she decided not to go by the underground, and instead leapt into a taxi, and by half-past eleven finally arrived at the clarion's offices, washed, dressed, and looking almost presentable. He was greeted without surprise by his colleagues in the news section, who knew his ways. Make a staff's on the warpath, one young man informed him. Hope you've got a good story, although I don't think anything less than bubonic plague will get you off the riot act. Where is he? said Freddy. In his office, with the Belcher. She's been spouting at him all morning. You'd better watch out, she's looking for victims. She caught Bill yesterday and forced him to sign a temperance pledge, and he's been in a foul mood ever since. Bill? said Freddy. He glanced across the room where a freckled messenger boy could be seen licking stamps ferociously, a look of lowering fury upon his face. Caught him off guard, said his colleague. If she asks me, I'm going to say I've sprained my wrist and can't write. Freddy shuddered. Mrs. Marjorie Belcher was the current scourge of the clarion, having made it her life's mission to effect the reform of society's morals by means of the organs of communication. In this, she was aided immeasurably by the fact that she was the sister of Sir Aldridge Featherstone, the paper's owner, which gave her significant influence and constant access to the newsroom. She was the founder and leader of the Young Women's Abstinence Association, patron of at least two charities which sought to promote the adoption of a more virtuous way of life through healthy exercise and a fervent believer in getting ten hours sleep a night. She was almost fanatical in her enthusiasms, and while it ought to have been easy enough to avoid hearing about them merely by avoiding her, in reality she was so highly connected that it was almost impossible to attend any society party or reception without finding her also in attendance, or being buttonholed by her at least once, for she was ever hopeful of persuading her acquaintances at the higher end of society to join one of her organisations. She had been haunting the newsroom of late, and there were rumours among the staff that her brother, Sir Aldridge Featherstone himself, had been listening to her strictures, and was preparing to forbid the publication of the more scurrilous stories in which the clarion tended to specialise. There was much dismay at the thought, for if the paper were to take a moral tone, then everybody knew it would quickly lose ground to its deadly rival, the Herald. And that would be the end of everything. Oh, here they come, said the young man. Better look busy. A door at the end of the newsroom opened as he spoke, and out came Mr. Bickerstaff, accompanied by a large and officious-looking woman of middle age and respectable attire. Freddy slid quietly into his seat and affected to be busy with his notebook. The two moved slowly through the room, deep in conversation. Mr. Bickerstaff was wearing his most ingratiating smile. As they approached, the woman could be heard saying, And of course, it's no good at all if we cannot set an example ourselves. How are we to right the morals of the working classes if we cannot look to our own behaviour and pronounce it irreproachable? It is our duty, Mr. Bickerstaff, to conduct ourselves at all times as though we were under constant observation, not only by our inferiors, but also by a higher power, one who will judge us when the final day comes and find us all wanting, some of us more than others. This last was pronounced in a portentous tone. Oh, quite, Mrs. Vilcher, said Mr. Bickerstaff. They had now reached Freddy's desk. Freddy arranged some papers busily and seemed to be hunting about for a pencil. 
Mr. Bickerstaff caught sight of him and drew himself up. You, he began, pointing a finger at Freddy. But he was not allowed to continue, for Mrs. Belcher had not yet finished. She was looking about her at the reporters, who were all avoiding her eye and pretending to work. Perhaps some of your personnel might be persuaded to join us, in fact, she said. If we can show the masses that even the fourth estate is working to support us, then they might be more likely to listen to what we have to say. Young man, she said, addressing Freddy as he rose politely, you will not refuse, I'm sure. I've no doubt that Mr. Bickerstaff has told you of our cause. Indeed, there is no more enthusiastic proponent of it than himself. For far too long our streets have been a hotbed of criminality, vice, alcohol, and sin. Our object is to cleanse the country of these diseases before they take hold and society becomes wholly incurable. A fine aim, certainly, said Freddy who was by no means recovered from the effects of at least one of the entries on her list, and was holding the edge of his desk to prevent himself from swaying. Mrs. Belcher looked at him more closely. What is your name? We've made before, have we not? she said. Pilkington Sams, madam, he replied. I believe you know my mother. He was beginning to feel rather sick, and wanted nothing more than to go home and lie down again. Ah, yes! exclaimed Mrs. Belcher. A very good woman and wholly sympathetic to the cause. She was only too keen to come to my charity reception this afternoon. I shall look forward to seeing her at all our temperance meetings in future. At the mention of his mother, Freddy frowned as a flash of memory returned to him. He was almost sure she had been at the Eaton Terrace house last night, but presumably she had left before him that morning. Had there been a row of some sort? Mrs. Belcher had now moved on to another desk and was haranguing an elderly man for smoking. Mr. Bickerstaff took advantage of her distraction to advance upon Freddy with a menacing look. Freddy braced himself for the worst, but before Mr. Bickerstaff could begin, he was interrupted by a lackey with an important message. He glanced at the paper and pursed his lips, then looked up at Freddy. One of your lot, I think, he said. I beg your pardon, sir, said Freddy. Dead body in Belgravia. Caroline Terrace. Mark Travers, the name is. Know him? He's been found dead outside his next-door neighbor's house, and the police are hinting at foul play. At that, there was a loud crash, as the memories returned all at once, and Freddy sat down suddenly, accidentally sweeping the contents of his desk onto the floor as he did so. His neighbor's house? Number 25? Oh, good Lord, he said. There was some little bustle as several people started forward to pick up the mess. Are you quite all right, young man? said Mrs. Belcher, alerted by the noise. You look a little unwell, I must say. Freddy was staring straight ahead, white in the face, as an image of himself wheeling the dead body of Ticky Maltravers from his mother's house to Caroline Terrace in a child's toy wagon danced through his mind in all its magnificence and glory. He put his head in his hands and groaned. I need a drink, he said. Well, really, said Mrs. Belcher, taken aback. You don't look well, old chap, said the young man at the next desk. I take it you knew him, said Mr. Bickerstaff. Freddy pulled himself together with some effort. No, at least not well, he said. He was a friend of my mother's. Ah, oh, yes, your mother, said Mr. Bickerstaff. Where's she this morning, by the way? She hasn't sent in her copy yet, and we need it by three for the six o'clock edition. I expect she's hovering excitedly around Scotland Yard trying to get a glimpse of the corpse, said the young man. Sorry, Freddy, he said hurriedly as Freddy glared at him. Just my little joke. You said the police are talking about foul play, said Freddy to Mr. Bickerstaff. Does that mean they suspect murder? Can't say from this said Mr. Bickerstaff, looking at the message. Just as here, there are some suspicious circumstances. Jolliffe, he said to the young man. You go along there and find out what's going on. Do you mind if I go instead, sir? said Freddy. Well, after all, I, I did know him uh, a little, anyway, he added hastily. Mr. Bickerstaff stared at him doubtfully. But I'm supposed to be having a word with you, he said. Excuse me, am I to understand that Mr. Pilkington Soames was a friend of this unfortunate person? said Mrs. Belcher. 
Why, there's no wonder he looks so unwell. It must be a terrible shock. And to offer to write the story, too, at such a moment. That's very spirited of you, young man. Mr. Bickerstaff, the country needs more young people such as this. Too often these days we see youth so easily overcome by the slightest blow. But Mr. Pilkington Soames here is a perfect demonstration of what a stout heart can do. Thank you, madam, said Freddy, bravely. I hope I understand my duty. Jolliffe at the next desk let out a snigger, which he covered with a cough. You do look very pale, however, went on Mrs. Belcher. Perhaps you ought to go home and recover. Oh, there's no need for that, said Freddy. But I should like to go and cover the story, if you don't mind, sir. After all, I did know him a little, and I know some of his pals very well. I rather think I can make something of it, if you'll let me. Oh, very well said Mr. Bickerstaff grudgingly, but don't think you're off the hook just yet. Well, what are you waiting for? Get along. Freddy needed no further encouragement. He wished Mrs. Belcher a respectful good morning and headed for the door. He needed to find out what the police knew and then speak to his mother. Chapter 4 Inspector Entwistle stood outside the front door of Number 24, Caroline Terrace, in close conference with his sergeant, Bird, and another man carrying a little black case that announced him immediately as a doctor. The inspector was a man whom nobody could have picked out in a crowd, and that was the way he liked it. For twenty years he had dedicated himself to his job almost to the exclusion of all else, and he regretted it not for a moment. His calling was the law and the law he meant to uphold, come what may. Sergeant Bird, more affable and less unbending, had nonetheless worked with his superior for some years now and knew how to manage him, and the two men rubbed along fairly well for the most part. They now listened earnestly to what the doctor had to tell them about the strange events of that morning. Nicholas Maltravers had been discovered outside the house of his next-door neighbour at number 25, Caroline Terrace, at eight o'clock, when the maid had come out to scrub the step. The young woman had screamed loudly at the unexpected sight of a dead man in full evening dress propped up against her nice clean railings, and the noise had brought out her elderly mistress, who was not a little displeased at having her breakfast interrupted by such a row. Miss Fosdyke was made of sterner stuff than her maid. She recognised Tiki immediately and sent the girl round to fetch Weaver, Tiki's manservant. Weaver went pale at the sight, wrung his hands and summoned a doctor, and together they carried Tiki into his own house and laid him as best they could on his bed. The doctor had attended to Tiki many times and knew him well, and his suspicions were very soon aroused by one or two little circumstances that caused him to frown. He questioned Weaver closely about where his master had been last night, and whether he had been in any way unwell recently, and then announced that he could not think of issuing a death certificate until the police had been called. A young constable was sent along, but swiftly saw that it was a serious matter, and that more help would be needed. He was now engaged in keeping an eye on the small crowd of people who had gathered outside number 24 to watch proceedings, while Entwistle and Bird heard what the doctor had to say. So, you see what I mean about the traces, Dr. Spillman was saying. The unnatural position of the body first gave me pause, since it was propped up most awkwardly against the railings. His lower parts were not quite touching the ground, while his right foot had been jammed against the doorstep as though to hold him in place. That puzzled me slightly, but my suspicions were not fully confirmed until after we'd moved him and carried him up to bed. That's when I noticed traces of vomit around the mouth, although there was no mess where he was found. Then, when I examined the rest of him, I saw that the heels of his shoes were worn and scraped, and that the hems on his trousers were also a little frayed and dirty, just as though he'd been dragged. You think someone put him there, then? said Entwistle. Yes. At first glance, it looked as though he'd been taken ill and had collapsed against the railings and slid down into a sitting position. And I expect that is what we were meant to think. But when I examined him at just before nine of this morning, it was clear that rigour was well advanced, and he had obviously been dead some time, perhaps as much as ten or twelve hours. However, Miss Fosdyke's maid says that she just glanced out into the street at half-past eleven last night when she locked up, and he was not there then. 
It's not certain, of course, but I think someone put him here when he had already begun to stiffen and arranged him to look as if he had died outside the house. I do beg your pardon, Inspector, had I been thinking more clearly. I should, of course, have insisted on his being left where he was found, but my mind was on other things this morning, and I had no particular reason to suspect foul play initially. I'm afraid you'll just have to take my word for it about his original position. Hmm, said Entwistle. And you're sure there was no heart trouble? None at all. I'd attended him for years, and his heart was as sound as a bell. He had one or two other conditions, but none that would cause him to collapse suddenly and die in the street. I can't say what killed him, but it certainly bears further investigation, don't you think? Perhaps, said Entwistle, non-committally. The doctor prepared to leave. I'd like to stand and speak to the police surgeon when he arrives, but I'm already late for several appointments, he said. Here's my card, anyway. I shall be back in my office by three if he wants to speak to me. And with a brisk nod, he hurried off. Inspector Entwistle was already looking about him. So, if this Mount Travers was brought here, where was he brought from? He said. And how was he killed? You think it was murder, then, sir? said Sergeant Bird. Can't say until Ingleby gets here and takes a look at him, said Entwistle. But in the meantime, there's no harm in scouting about a bit. He went to peer at the pavement outside number 25. Ah, he said. See here. Yes. Unmistakable traces of black shoe polish and leather, I should say. He was certainly dragged. But the trace only stands here in the middle of the streets. He wasn't dragged all the way, then. What if he collapsed here in the streets and someone moved him? Suggested Bird. Why would they do that and not call for help? Perhaps they thought he was drunk. Possible, I suppose. Although this doctor chappy seems to think he was already stiff when he was propped up. You couldn't drag a dead body and not notice he was dead. True enough, conceded the sergeant. But why did they put him outside number 25 when he lives at number 24? Was it deliberate? I have no idea, said Entwistle. He was still looking about him thoughtfully. Perhaps someone wanted to play a nasty joke on Miss Fosdyke, said Bird. Mm, there must be some reason for it, said Entwistle. Unless whoever it was dumped him there by mistake. We'll need to speak to this manservant. What's his name? Weaver. We'll find out what his gentleman was doing last night. He's in the house, yes? Prostrate with grief, said the sergeant, resignedly. Couldn't get a word out of him. I said we'd come back. Well, he'd better not suffer too long. We haven't time for fits of the vapours. And who is this? Stay back, sir. Police. He was addressing a slightly dishevelled-looking young man who had just pushed through the little crowd and passed the protesting police constable, and who now paused to look about him with interest, as though he had all the time in the world. What do you think you're doing? said Sergeant Bird. Freddy bestowed an ingratiating smile upon the two policemen. Sorry, I was just stopping to get a whiff of the atmosphere and all that, what? The readers like a bit of local colour with their corpses. A press, he explained. Pilkington Soames, here on behalf of the Clarion. Here's my card. I'm afraid it's a little battered and wrinkled around the edges from the time I went to speak to Mr Bartholomew, you know, the trade union leader, during the dock workers' strike, and his Doberman Pincher took a liking to it and dropped it into the Regent's Canal. Luckily, a passing bargeman fished it out for me, but it's never been the same since. I prefer smaller dogs myself. There's something not quite natural about a dog that's so tall it can look one straight in the eye, don't you think? The Clarion said Inspector Entwistle, fastening upon the one salient detail of this speech. We've got nothing for you at present. Come to the yard later, if you must, but don't bother us now. Ah, here's Ingleby, he said, as the little police surgeon arrived. I want a word with him. He hurried off, and Sergeant Bird was left to deal with the prayers. Friendly chap, isn't he? said Freddy. He hasn't got time for trivialities, said Bird, assessing the young man with a practised eye. I might take exception to being called a triviality, said Freddy. Luckily for you, I have an extraordinarily thick skin, so I'll forgive you on this occasion. Good of you, said the sergeant. But he's right, you know. There's nothing doing here at the moment. You'll be better off waiting until we've finished. Are you familiar with the word deadline? said Freddy. Something to do with fishing, isn't it? said Bird. Not exactly. It's the line beyond which stands a door marked the boot, which is why I fully intend to stand here and talk at you until you give me something I can put in the paper. Come now, he went on in his most persuasive manner. 
You wouldn't want to see me, my wife, and my five children out on the street by the end of the week purely because I couldn't get four hundred words to my editor in time for the six o'clock edition, now would you? I wouldn't, if I believed a word of it, sir, said Bird comfortably. But you heard what Inspector Entwistle said, and anyway, there's nothing to tell. The gentleman was found dead outside his next-door neighbour's house, and we don't yet know how it happened. His next-door neighbour's house, eh? That's interesting. Any idea how he got there? Had he gone there for tea or something? No. He was found there early this morning, having somehow arrived there during the night. But there must be something you're not telling me, Sergeant, said Freddy. I mean, to say you wouldn't be here now if there weren't something suspicious about his death. What is it? A gunshot wound to the temple? A dagger to the heart? A mysterious note smelling faintly of perfume clutched in the dead man's hand? Nothing so exciting as that, I'm afraid, said Bird, amused despite himself. The only mystery at present is how he came to be where he was, as it rather looks as if someone put him there. At least that's what his doctor says. But we don't know who, and we don't know how. No witnesses, I suppose, said Freddy, as casually as possible. Not so far. This is a quiet street, and it's unlikely anybody was out and about in the middle of the night. As for the dead man, he certainly wasn't shot or stabbed, but we won't know how he did die until there's been a post-mortem examination. And now that's all I can tell you. Splendid. And in return, I shall tell you that I knew the dead man. Slightly, at any rate. Did you, indeed? said Bird with sudden interest. Yes, I thought that might get you. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised you haven't heard of him yourself, or are you one of these types of professors not to read the society pages? I may have perused them on occasion, admitted Bird, cautiously. Then you must have heard of Tiki Maltravers, surely. The name does sound familiar. Is this the same gentleman? The very same. Now listen, I'm in a spot of trouble with my editor, and he's put me onto this story, and if I can steal a march on the competition, the Herald in particular, then I'll be back in his good books. What do you say to a little exchange of information? You tell me what you know, or at least as much as you can say without ruining your case, and I'll tell you anything I find out. A sort of quid pro quo, what? I can't promise anything, said Bird. The inspector's not too keen on that kind of thing. Doesn't trust the press, eh? said Freddy. Very wise, as a general rule. I, however, am a man of unimpeachable morals and ironclad honour who would never dream of publishing a story without your say-so. That remains to be seen, said Bird. As I said, we can't be certain there's any mystery at all yet. I've told you all I know, and if you can get four hundred words out of that, then you're a better man than I am. Oh, I shall pad it out somehow said Freddy, with a wave of the hand. It's rather a gift of mine. I once spent six hundred words describing the hat ribbons of an abandoned wife who killed her children, then herself, and everyone said it was one of the most moving and tragic things I'd ever written. So let's take that as agreed, shall we? I shall go off and write my little piece, then you shall read it, and see that I am exactly what I purport to be, and can be relied upon not to transform a dull new story into a work of vulgar fiction, although you must allow for a little poetic license, naturally, and then we shall become friends and entrust one another with such little tidbits of information that might happen to come our way. I make no promises, said Sergeant Bird again. Now, you're standing where you ought not to, so you better go off and write your story. No hat ribbons here, I'm afraid. He then went off to speak to the constable, leaving Freddy to think about what he had learnt. Despite his apparent insouciance, he was, in fact, deeply relieved that the police had not arrested him on the spot as soon as he had arrived. They had evidently not found any witnesses to the disposal of Tiki's body yet, and Freddy trusted fervently that they never would, and that by ingratiating himself with the police he would throw them off the scent. The inspector did not look like much of a prospect, but this sergeant seemed a friendly enough sort, and would perhaps let him know what was going on with the investigation. Ever since the memory of last night had come back to him, Freddy had been kicking himself at his own stupidity and was at present highly displeased with his mother for having taken advantage of him in his weakened state, for he had no desire to run afoul of the law, and was quite certain he would never have agreed to what she had asked of him had he been fully compassmentous at the time. But was Cynthia right when she said Tiki had been poisoned? How did she know?' 
or was she being overdramatic as usual? If she was right, then the police were bound to find it out, and then they would start asking awkward questions about where everybody had been last night. Of course, Tiki's death was nothing to do with Freddy, but he suspected the police would not look too kindly upon his half-unwitting interference in the affair. The thing to do now was to find his mother, and quickly. But where was she? Just then, Freddy remembered his conversation with Marjorie Belcher, who had mentioned that Cynthia was supposed to be attending her charity reception at Sir Aldridge Featherstone's house that afternoon. He would have to run her to earth there. At any rate, he seemed safe from arrest for the moment. Two men were now emerging from number 24, bearing a covered figure on a stretcher. The little crowd which had gathered in the street now became very excited and surged forward in an attempt to get a better view as Sergeant Bird and the ineffectual police constable tried to hold them back. Freddy took the opportunity to melt away. The reception was at three, he seemed to remember. He would have some lunch to restore his faculties, then he would go and find his mother and give her a piece of his mind. Chapter 5 At twelve o'clock that same day, Nancy Beasley was lying in bed at her house in Charles Street, a cold compress on her forehead, dictating a letter to her secretary, an attractive and competent young woman of twenty-five. Let's see, she said. Shall I start, dear Lady Featherstone, or shall I risk Constance? It's so difficult to know what to do in these circumstances. Obviously, one doesn't want to offend, but if I give her the full title, I've as good as admitted that I know she's snubbing me. What do you think, Anne? Anne Chadwick thought for a moment. It is difficult, she conceded, and I'm not sure I know the answer, since I haven't seen the two of you together lately. How was she the last time you saw her? Oh, the same as before. Quite cut me dead when she saw me. And in public, too. Only think of the humiliation. It's too bad of her. And it's not as though I did it on purpose. How was I to know she was throwing her beastly party on the same day as mine? Just a tiny little faux pas, and she's been holding a grudge against me for months now. And after all I put myself through to get in with her in the first place, all those charitable committees I've inveigled myself onto, and all the things I've had to hide from Marjorie Belcher, who simply can't imagine that a person might want to have a little fun once in a while. I don't suppose for one second that Constance is as virtuous as she makes out to be, but with a sister-in-law like Mrs. Belcher, she can pretend as much as she likes to be holier than thou, and nobody doubts it for a second. I'll bet no one asked her a lot of awkward questions about her views on drink before they led her on the board of trustees. Hateful woman. I can't bear people who won't forgive and forget. If you can't bear Lady Featherstone, then surely it doesn't matter what you call her, said Anne. And there must be other charities who would be glad of your help. Silly girl, I don't give a fig about the charities, said Nancy pettishly. It's the look of the thing that's important. Of course I must pretend to be her friend. Why, you know perfectly well that she throws the most important parties. One simply has to be seen at them, or one might as well retire to the wilds of Scotland and take up fishing. The invitations will be going out to her Christmas ball soon, and everyone who's anyone will be there, so I can't possibly let her freeze me out. I'd simply die if she didn't invite me, and Cynthia would never let me hear the last of it. Think of everyone gloating over it if she put it in the clarion. I should never be able to hold my head up in public again. In that case, I think the best choice would be the formal title. Oh, you think I ought to grovel? said Nancy, wrinkling her nose. Perhaps it might be safest. Oh, but it's Mrs. Belcher's reception this afternoon, said Anne, as a thought struck her. Lady Featherstone will be there, won't she? Perhaps you might leave the letter for now and see whether you can't try and thaw things a little in person first. Now there's an idea, said Nancy. Do you know, I believe you're right. I shall go to the reception and be charming and delightful to Mrs. Belcher, and then Constance will have no choice but to acknowledge me, because she's the one who'll look bad if she doesn't. Oh, she might be cool, but she certainly can't ignore me, and that'll be a start at any rate. You'll back me up, won't you, Anne? Oh, Dennis, darling, she 